Welcome to Parallax Views. Frank B. Wilderson, author of Afro Pessimism, a very interesting new book. How are you doing today, Frank? Fantastic. Great to be here, JG. Thank you. So, Dr. Wilderson, I, I have to ask you uh, when we first got in touch, uh, you mentioned that you liked the name of, of my podcast. Uh, because it was Parallax Views. And you said, is that named after the movie? And I know you teach uh, film study classes. And you said, oh, I love that movie. And I always am interested in how movies influence uh, some of my guests. What, why were you a fan of uh, that movie in particular, Parallax View, the 70s conspiracy, conspiracy thriller for my listeners that may be unfamiliar? Well, first of all, I... I, um, I I have a kind of affinity, a kind of astrological affinity for artists who are born in my, under my sign of Aries. And uh, Warren Beatty is one of those people, along with Sarah Vaughan and, and, and uh, Gil Scott Heron and um, Paul Robeson, you know. And so I, I've seen Warren Beatty, I don't like everything he did, like shampoo I could, you know, uh, but, but there are two movies that he did, uh, Parallax View and um, and Reds. Reds was the story of John Reed, who in the 19 teens was a journalist from Portland and went to Russia to be with Lenin. So I, I think that Parallax View is one of these 70s movies. And, and for me as a film theorist, uh, um, there's this kind of sweet spot in Hollywood cinema, which I don't really like, but there is a sweet spot between 1967 and 1977 in which the movement on the ground, the anti-war movement, the Black Panther movement, uh, American Indian movement, the war in Vietnam, seeped into the consciousness of mainstream Hollywood filmmakers in like, like a consciousness um, through a prism. I mean, it wasn't like they became radicals, but they began to make these movies which showed uh, a kind of America that I write about in my book, which is a dystopic America, a, a, an America that is so corrupt and without ethics that it has no capacity to be reformed. And so I dig that, you know, that, that's, <laughs> and I think that, you know, as a teenager uh, in, uh, in, in uh, high school, um, I think it's like 11th grade through my senior year in college, what am I dealing with? In those three years, I'm dealing with the Watergate situation, and I'm just you know watching it grow and grow and grow. To the time I go to college, this whole conspiracy is opening up with the hearings, right? And right, right. And so what I think what I think is that I really appreciate the way in which the film ends. A spoiler alert for your viewers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> with the shat with the death of the protagonist by a shadowy government figure, you know, someone like it could, could be like G. Gordon Liddy or someone like that. You know, we, we don't even know because the person's in silhouette. And the way in which you're just constantly being infused with a sense that the state has injected itself into those so-called um, pristine, separate institutions of civil society like newspapers and journalism and uh and it's and it's one big police state that this person is uncovering and ultimately the, the victim of and that's the america i know as a black person so i really dig it from 66 67 to 77 when uh white filmmakers were also thinking along those lines and it was a sweet spot it didn't happen before, and it certainly hasn't happened afterwards. So that's part of the reason why, you know, and, and, and the film is, I think it's very well made. There, I, I look at things online today from IMDb, and I see that uh, you're a very rare young person, JG. And I see the, uh, the reviews from young people like saying, ah, uh, it doesn't have much music in it, you know? 
<laughs> or it's dull. You know, I'm like, no, this is a cerebral thing about the state and civil society. And, you know, uh, it's, so I teach it as a political tool uh, to also to show students what can happen to popular culture when it is infused with the revolutionary zeitgeist of a movement on the ground. That's, that's fascinating to me because I think I, I do, there is something I want to say dystopic or I, I, discomforting at times about Afro-pessimism uh, reading it. I, I, I think it's, it's confrontational in a way. I, I don't know if you'd agree with that or not. Well, it doesn't matter if I agree with it. So many people tell me that, that it must be true. I mean, I, I, the, the Mail and Guardian in South Africa today is, uh, today is the 25th of, of June and uh, tomorrow uh, the print edition is, is having a three-part series um, on my book and my time in South Africa. And uh, one of the things I say, you know, in that is that many people encounter Afro-pessimism as if they're being mugged, you know, as if the theory itself is mugging them, because the emancipatory discourses of radical revolutionary feminism, which is built on psychoanalysis, or radical uh, political economy activism, which is built on Marxism, they all come to you with this thing that says, the world has to be undone. But then they say, here's the prescription of how to make a new world. And Afro-pessimism doesn't say that. It simply says the world has to be undone. And it doesn't offer a prescription as to what a new world would look like. And that kind of thing really affects not the intellect, but the emotional apparatus of people who were trained in Britain and the, and the United States. It's an Anglo-American foundation of learning that I think is impoverished because unlike Germany, unlike various parts of South America, unlike intellectual work I did in South Africa, Americans cannot emotionally go into problems unless they have a solution attached to it. And Afro-pessimism does not offer you that because it says that Black people are the foils of humanity. Yeah, I wanted to find terms a little bit when it when it comes to Afro pessimism. I guess, and maybe this seems like an, an almost ridiculously uh, basic question, but how, how would you define uh, blackness? I guess first off, well, I think that blackness uh, is the definition. Afro pessimism is challenging the colloquial and and common sense definition of, of blackness that in my view, has passed erroneously as, um, as a definition. You know, it's not a definition. I mean, in other words, people think of it as a, as a cultural identity. And what we're saying is that it's a paradigmatic position. It's hard, to, it's hard to explain that to people unlike yourself who are not trained in critical theory. So the way I do it, especially with, with undergraduates, even with graduates, is to say, look, what marks I said, let's, let's forget Afro pessimism for, for 30 seconds. I can explain to you what blackness is by saying what Marx did. What Marx did is he takes the knowledge that he learned from his mentor Hegel and he refashions it into, into a materialist dialectic. But then he says there was a paradigm of feudalism in which there were serfs and overlords. And through the bourgeois revolutions of about a period of 100 years, depending upon what countries you're in, you get a new paradigm. And in this new paradigm, you have new positions, the two new positions. And in critical theory, we call these, we call the, the, the positions of paradigms that are essential, not that important, the ones that are essential, we call them the, we call it inaugural division. So that when a paradigm is set up, inaugural division happens. So where the paradigm of gender initiates the inaugural division of sex, and it creates a, a, a false category called man and a false category called woman. In other words, I don't mean false in line, I mean constructed. So what Marx is saying is that we get a new thing, a new paradigm, it's called capitalism. And that requires new positions. One is called worker and one is called capitalist. But inside those positions 
are millions of identities. You have Chinese, Japanese, you have, you know, ethnicities. So, so a, a very, a very rigorous analysis of paradigm does not confuse position with identity. And what we are saying is that the slave incursion on Africa by Arabs, Chinese, Iranians, Iraqis, uh, East Indians, and even Moroccan Jews, this kind of pincer move from the north and the east that begins in 625 AD creates a new position that before that there were identities called Maasai, Shona, Ndebele, Ashante, Buganda, Igbo, but then a position gets created in this paradigm and the position we would call loosely human and black. And so black is a structural position for Afro-pessimism. Most people in black studies write about black as a cultural identity. And we're saying that if you really think about it, there are no black people in the world prior to a global consensus that Africa is a place of slaves. That the word black in Africa emerged through the enslavement of people who had identities. Just like the word worker and capitalist emerge through a revolution and the identities stay, but the paradigm changes. And so what we have here is we argue that black is, and this is gonna be a double negative, is the absence of humanness. And how do we make that argument? By saying that inside the category of human, there are hundreds of thousands of identities and cultures. And inside the identity, the, 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 the position of human, there are exalted humans, like blonde haired white people from England and France and Scandinavia, and there are degraded humans, like Native Americans and dark skinned Guatemalans. But they, they all share something structurally. Just like inside the position of worker, there are exalted workers, like a professor in Stockholm with all kinds of leave and a social democratic medical benefits. And there are degraded workers, like people in the Mikiadoras and sweatshops. But they, they represent the same position because they are all the hosts of a parasite who sucks surplus value from them. So what we're saying is that there are many kinds of black people. There are many kinds of African black people. There are Caribbean black people. There are European black people. There are many kinds of South and North American black people, but they are all black because they all occupy the space of non-being in the collective unconscious of the world. And they all are subjected to a violence that is radically different than the violence of degraded humans. What is that violence? That violence is called gratuitous violence, meaning that violence against native people, against brown people is horrifying, genocidal, but it is contingent upon the exalted humans thinking that they are transgressing. But violence upon black people is simply based upon a pre-logical dispensation. There's nothing a black person does to transgress. Violence against black people is necessary to the psychic well-being of everyone else. So we're trying to get away from thinking about lynchings and police murders as discrimination and start thinking about them as psychic healing rituals for the human race. Because the human race can say, that could happen to me. But if it happened to me, I would have to be accused of doing something as a group or as a person, crossing the border or wanting my land back. So the black is a sentient being for whom no uh, value and no rights and provisions of civil society are available. And it means that the violence against black people is pre-logical and cannot be conceptually coherent. Because if that happened, it would become contingent violence and black people would be human. So what's interesting is you mentioned uh, this concept of, of human. And I found that very interesting 
within your book, Afro-Pessimism, uh, because we often hear the word uh, white supremacy. We, we don't often hear the, the word uh, human being in opposition to blackness, which that's sort of my understanding that humanity defines itself uh, by anti-blackness uh, in, in your book. Yeah, so uh, for your viewers who want to know more about this, um, they should, they should, we built this theory on other people's work, but we've hijacked the uh, assumptive logic because a lot of these people wouldn't want to be called Afro pessimists, you know, like, so Orlando Patterson wrote a book and to, to simplify without being simplistic, what he said was, I, Orlando Patterson, I'm going to write this book called Slavery and Social Death, which will define the slave-master relation. He says, there are hundreds, maybe hundreds of thousands of books before 1982 that uh, say they're gonna do the same thing. And he says, but I'm slapping them on the hands because what they have done is they've reported on the experience of slavery and they have not actually define the structure of the relation. This is precisely what Marx does in Das Kapital. He says the relation is immaterial and it cannot be concretized. In other words, there's a period from after lunch to 5 p.m. in which the time of the worker is sucked by the capitalists to produce surplus value. You can't pick up a tool and show that. It is, it's like to show a structural relation is like throwing paint at the invisible man to make him out. And so we as Americans are impoverishing our training because so much of our training is based on observation and empiricism, which is very different than continental training, right? And so we're trying to impose um, a training that says, um, what, is, what does it mean to be human? It means that the violence of the state and civil society that comes down on you is always triggered by something. I don't, I don't mean that the state and civil society are, are ethical because when the violence against brown people happens, it is triggered by the transgression of crossing the border, which is unethical because historically the border crossed them. I am now in California, which should be Mexico, okay? So all I'm saying is that, um, could you help me for a minute? Because so, so, so I, I talk a lot. To get, come back to the center of your question, so I, I'm sure that I don't go off on a tangent. Well, I, I, was, I was curious, uh, about this idea of the the sort of humanity defining itself against blackness yes. uh, because we often hear the term white supremacy uh, but you use the term humanity even even more so than that yeah okay so thank you very much because i was i was gonna go somewhere else but to make it simple what Pat, what patterson argues is that in order to have a so-called free society, that conceptually you've got to have a slave formation. To, it's, it's almost like the semiotics, it's almost like a semiotics of violence. In other words, most of us think that the word cat, C-A-T, means a warm, fuzzy animal who won't get your slippers, you know, and will only talk to you when it wants some food. But in actuality, cat, all words, get their meaning through an opposition. In other words, words do not, if I, when I say to students, I say, okay, what is a table, what, how would you define table? And they would knock on the- Right, the, right. I said, no, 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 no. If a table, if the word table actually means the thing in phenomena, and I said to you, okay, let's table this discussion then you would have to throw the table at me, okay? Which means that you have not crossed the bar of metaphor. So in semiotics, what we learn is that words actually don't mean the thing in the world. They mean 
the opposite of other concepts. They're conceptually. So cat is defined through its collateral acquaintances, which would be tiger, leopard, lion, but it's ultimately defined through the thing it is not, which is dog. And so to, to enlarge that at a higher scale of abstraction, society, freedom, free society, democracy, these are words that, are, that do not have organic meaning in phenomenon, what Patterson is saying. They can only mean something to the mind if the mind also knows what they absolutely do not mean. So freedom ultimately gets its co conceptual coherence because it does not mean slavery. And Patterson's point is that you cannot have an organized society without having conceptually available the slave. You cannot have free people without having conceptually available the slave. And he says that every society in the world for the past thousands of years and across the globe have enslaved other people. And they have also been enslaved. Now, what we as Alpha Pessimists has, has said is that what is interesting, we agree with Patterson's argument. So, you, so human cannot have an organic meaning. It has right. to be defined by its opposite. And what's interesting is that this word black comes up at a time when all kinds of people around the world reach a global concept, consensus almost intuitively that Africa is a place of people who are always already slaves. And that consensus tracks all the way through the centuries. It tracks from 625 AD all the way to the Dred Scott decision where Chief Justice Taney of the Supreme Court says, I'm returning, justice, I'm returning Dred Scott to slavery not because I agree with the lower court who said he should go back to slavery, not because I disagree with the lower court who said he was free because he got to Minnesota, but because you lower courts were all wrong. You should never have tried a non-being as a subject of jurisprudence. And he writes in that there are Native Americans who are degraded forms of humans, who can become exalted forms of humans if they learn white ways. But Dred Scott comes from Africa, he writes. Africa is a place of non-being. You forgot that. And so, and so what we're saying is that inside of humanity, there's all kinds of horrors. There's all kinds of domination. At the top is the white exalted being who dominates the other colored people, but they all share something. Even as they're killing each other, they share the fact that they're not black. In other words, they share the fact that they are not slave. And this is what gives the world its stability psychically, its coherence conceptually. But that coherence has to be repeated. It has to be repeated through lynchings, through police killings, through macro and microaggressions, through Hollywood films which show the mutilation of, of, of black bodies. Mutilation of black flesh is necessary for the continuation of conceptual coherence of what it means to be human. And so we then say anti, we then say white supremacy is what happens to colored people inside of humanity. Anti-blackness is what happens to black people when they get the boot on their neck from all people in humanity, even those people who are suffering white supremacy. In, in other words, the, the free needs to define itself by the, the slave, the, the non-suffering person needs to define themselves by the person who suffers, which in this case would be uh, people that are black. Yeah. Yes, because conceptually, there has to be an embodiment in every society of someone who has no rights to that society. It's a controversial idea, but it's, it's backed up by a very large body of research. Um, and that's where we are launching pad. And I guess that leads into a, another aspect of Afro-pessimism is that 
it, it's sort of a, a memoir in ways. Maybe we could talk about why you chose to approach uh, the book that way, because it's, it's part critical theory, part uh, sort of biographical. Yeah, I, I have, uh, you know, my first degree after, after college uh, was a master's in fine arts and fiction writing. And that's my love and that's my passion. Um, I did that from 89 to 91. So I'm a storyteller by trade. And, you know, I would like to retire from critical theory at some point, <laughs> although the world doesn't seem to be letting me do that with all these murders of black people and all the, the, the movements. But I would like to retire at some point to just go back to creative writing. So that's my passion. And that's um, after, I, after I got my degree in, in fiction writing from Columbia, I went to South Africa and worked in the ANC, above ground and underground, for about five years. And there were purges of the ultra, ultra leftists. And I, returned, I had to do something. And so I didn't want to go back to the disastrous days right after college when I was in the corporate world. And I always liked learning and reading. So I got a PhD in critical theory from UC Berkeley in the rhetoric department. And my second book was my dissertation, Red, White, and Black. So I felt that I was, I was really writing a novel in 2017, and I got a call from Verso Press in uh, Europe and from the New Press in New York uh, wanting a collection of political essays. And so I dropped the novel because I, this was my chance to get published in the trade world, which means that your books go to Barnes and Nobles and, and regular bookstores. Um, and then as it got going, I thought, well, what is the best, when you write a trade book, unlike my second book, which is geared towards grad students and professors, you, you're taught to write a trade book for a junior in college who's riding on the bus, very distracted, and is not going to look up any words. <laughs> and so that was kind of hard for me. And I thought, you know what, if I put the two things together, storytelling and critical theory, the critic, they, will, they will work to, to bolster each other's arguments and it will give pleasure as well to the reader and to, and to me as a writer. So those were, those were some of the motivations. And I could also see how the argument of Afro-pessimism had worked its way in my life from six years old in an all-white grade school in the rich area of Kenwood in Minneapolis all the way through South Africa and back to California. I guess in that regard, what, what do you think the most pivotal of your formative experiences were and that sort of inform your views on things? That's very interesting. Um, well, I think there were actually two, two moments. One was, um, one was the period uh, which I touch upon more in my first uh, just pure memoir called Incognito, which was this period of 1969 to 1970 when my mother was finishing her PhD and my dad was on sabbatical. So we were on the road and this was a highly intense moment uh, in history. Uh, che Guevara had just been killed like 12 months before. Um, the Tet Offensive had in Vietnam uh, another like seven months before that had shown the world that the American army is not invincible. Um, there was the Democratic Convention and the, the fights in the streets and the days of rage with SDS and the Black Panthers. And, um, and so I was leaving this little cloistered area called Minneapolis, Minnesota, where not much was popping off and uh, moving to Detroit and Chicago right when Fred Hampton was murdered, and then to Berkeley, California, when Nixon started bombing Cambodia, and Kent State murders went down in the Jackson State. And so that really, that really opened my eyes, you know, as someone moving from age 13 to 14, that the things I were experiencing in Minneapolis that were hurting me so much could be fought against by a revolution. So that was one thing. 
the next one was my time in South Africa, working uh, both above ground and underground, when I really, really thought we were about to uh, not just topple apartheid, but bring in a communist dispensation and redistribute the wealth. And so those two moments uh, in my life, um, and I write about it a little bit in, in this book. It's, it's kind of like uh, the period of Seattle um, that I talk about, uh, which is another in 1968. Um, and then the period in South Africa was 1989 to the end of 96. You know, so I'm moving from age 33 to age 40 in, those, in that period. And I really began to, it, it, those, those periods made it so that what I'm doing now doesn't feel like an academic exercise. I can, I can grasp the, the, the textual fabric of revolution in the stuff that I write about. You know that, well, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no I, I just, because I've seen it myself. I, well, that, that's, it's interesting you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, revolutionary thought, and you've mentioned Marx. I, I guess, I, I know you've talked about this in other interviews, that there's confusion over your stance on Marx. You're not dismissing Marx. Yes, God. Yeah, say more, say more. Go ahead. And, and also, I, I guess uh, the other point I wanted to make was, I, I found it interesting that uh, the book is called Afro-Pessimism. And usually when I, when I see the word pessimism, I think, I, for some reason, and I don't know why this is, I think, uh, oh, that, that's like a conservative or reactionary to be pessimistic. Uh, but when you say Afro-pessimism, I don't think you're coming from a, a conservative or a reactionary viewpoint. You're coming from a revolutionary viewpoint. So I was interested in, in exploring that a little bit more. Yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, Afro-pessimism is a meta-critique of critique. So you have you have two major, major paradigm shifts. In the, there are many paradigm shifts, but there are two major ones in the past 300 years. One is Marxism, where he, where he says, says, oh my God, here is the meaning of the word value. Everyone has been talking about value in colloquial terms. No, value is the magnitude of necessary labor time. Value is the blood sucked out of the working class when they come back to work after lunch, metaphorically speaking. That is what value is. And it's like, wow, the whole science of political economy changes because you cannot use that word colloquially anymore. The mind, the next paradigm shift is the mind. When Freud comes along and says, you cannot speak of yourself in a knowing way because the psyche is divided at least three times by pre-conscious and consciousness, by unconsciousness, and by structural position. And those three topos, meaning those three realms of the psyche, are always at odds with each other. What you say about yourself in terms of your sexual orientation is radically uh, rejoined and disagreed with by your unconscious trajectories of desire. Like if you say you're hetero, you're finding urges of desire that are, are lesbian or gay. And so, you know, so what he's saying is that I have now shown you that you cannot speak of the psyche in, in this way. So we have done this by saying you can't use the word human as though it has an organic meaning. We have to have its values. And so we are actually Gramscian, in the sense that a famous line from Gramsci is pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. And so what, thinking Gramsci through Marx, what Marx is, Marx is being pessimistic about the intellectual production of bourgeois economists because they concretize words without unpacking them and that solidifies capitalist ideology. Freud and Lacan are pessimistic 
about the intellectual production of what it means to have a psyche because it makes it as though uh, there is one psyche that can be known. So we are actually pessimistic of this universal intellectual production that says all sentient beings are this way or that way. It's not, it's not so much despair. I mean, it's it, one, one of the critiques that might be about emotion that we have is this sense that some people will say, well, there are black people who were not enslaved and they're still in Africa and therefore they do not have the kind of psychic trauma of anti-blackness that black Americans do. And we've argued that no, the experiences are different, but the trauma of anti-blackness is structurally the same. Just like the experience of someone working in a sweatshop is different than the experience of someone working at a high level in a Stockholm University, but they are both having surplus value extracted from them by the capitalists. So that's what we're pessimistic about. We're pessimistic about the emancipatory claims of universal theories of struggle and freedom. We don't, we're not, I am an anti-capitalist. I teach Das Kapital cover to cover, or at least volume one, 500 pages of it, you know, uh, I, I teach it every fall, you know. But I would also say that once capitalism is overthrown, which I'm definitely down for, there's still going to be anti-Blackness in the collective unconscious, precisely because of these other dynamics. In that regard, I guess, I guess the, the criticism of Afro-pessimism, and I, I don't know if this is fair or not, I, I've really been getting more into this now, um, especially since the uh, George Floyd uh, murder. I, I've been thinking more about Afro-pessimism I, I started out uh, when I when I went back to university. I was a big fan of Cornell West, and Cornell West felt like the sort of like anti-Afro pessimist in some ways, uh, you know. And and then I thought to myself, well, I, I should be reading Frank Wilderson. I, maybe I should give this a chance. Uh, do you think there's misconceptions about Afro pessimism um, with with thinkers like uh, Dr. Cornell West, or even uh, some of the reviews of Afro pessimism? Yeah, I, I, I think that people have not, there's a lot of work that you have to do to understand what, what Afro-pessimism is, okay? It's, it's like um, if people read France Fanon's Black Skin, White Mass, and they have not read Sartre, they have not read Simone de Beauvoir, uh, they have not read Lacan and Freud, then you're going to pick up maybe a quarter of what he's talking about. It's going to be useful, but he's this is a text, Black Skin White Mask, that is responding to other texts about what it means to suffer. And so there are a lot of people who, um, most people on the left who consider themselves to be critical theorists or, or thinkers, really look at the part of alpha pessimism that, cr that critiques Marx, even if, and some of them don't even go that deeply, okay? So what they haven't thought about is the arguments about how institutions are made and sustained through the collective unconscious, number one. Number two, how the collective unconscious of non-Black people is subtended, like uh, right angles of a, of a, of a triangle, like right? the unconscious, and this line would be structural violence. What is the relationship between phantasmagorical projections and the army, the police, legislation. So, you know, uh, there are, there are Afro-pessimist thinkers like me who a lot of people read and like, oh God, he's just, you know, cuckoo. But they, there are other Afro-pessimist thinkers who they don't read because it's probably too difficult for them, like David Marriott, who is the major, major anchor tenet of, the, of how, what is psychoanalysis and anti-Black violence how does that work together? And so I think that th this early stage is just a lot of misconception and mainly it's a knee-jerk response because people are asking the question, what is this gonna do 
to, if we embody and embrace Afro-pessimism? What's it gonna do to get black people equal rights? What's it gonna do to stop police brutality? And our answer is, we don't know. That's not, a, that's, we, we don't offer tactical or even strategic means to get to freedom. What we offer is a diagnosis of a cancer, not a cure for it. So it's, it's descriptive rather than prescriptive. Exactly. And the reason for that is not because we're lazy, but it's because we have the courage to embrace and engage a problem for which at this point in history, there is no conceptual solution. If you say that I am oppressed by a capitalist paradigm, Marx gives us the answer. Overthrow capitalism and infuse communism. If you say I'm impressed by a patriarchal paradigm, Judith Butler and Kaja Silverman and their readings of, of, of psychoanalysis give us the answer. Overthrow the bifurcation of gender and the triangulation of mommy, daddy, me, destroy the Oedipal nuclear family and reinstantiate kinship structure that is trans, kinship structure that organizes its, its power around more egalitarian distribution. But what we are saying is that building on Patterson, the slave is not a subject of political economy unlike the worker. The slave is an implement, an object of political economy. The slave is not a, a subject of kinship structures. Even though I say I have a father, I say I have a wife, I say I have a daughter. That's bullshit. It means nothing. And I, and, and it only me, it, I can only fool myself to think that it means something because I'm not literally standing on an option block in 1853. But I would know in 1853 that any claims I made to kinship would be just hoo-hoo, you know? So we cannot say reorganize kinship because we are outside of kinship. We are outside of oppressive kinship, which is patriarchal. We are also outside of a rejuvenated kinship that could be trans. We are outside of oppressive economy, which is capitalist. We are also outside of a new dismissation, which could be communist. And, that's a, and that is too deep a thinking for most people to go into because most people, especially in this training, which comes from largely Matthew Arnold's um, uh, culture and anarchy, in which he sets up the British public school system, and that happens over here as well. It's this, it's this way in which we are trained as British and North American scholars that we psychically cannot go into the abyss of problems unless there's some kind of idea about what the solution would be. And we're saying, yes, there is a solution, but it's the end of the world. And on the other side, there will be no Blacks, There'll be no humans, there'll be sentient beings, but it'll be a completely different epistemological structure. And I couldn't tell you what that looks like. We're fighting for it, but I don't know what it's gonna be. That's a scary proposition to most people. Well, it's, it's even like, a, and it, you know, I, I've said to people, you know, what, what would the end of something like whiteness look like? Uh, and I, I think that's a hard thing for people to wrap their head, head around. Uh, I, I think a lot of people say they want that, uh, an end to whiteness, including uh, I've I've heard like white leftists say that we need an end to whiteness. But like, what does that what does that mean? It sort of is an end of the world. It's a you know you have a new world coming out of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no one could say when when you know um, like a hundred years before Mozart, when the bourgeois revolution is is starting and gaining that, no one could say well. Everyone could say we don't dig this feudal serf society. And we are building ships and we are importing slaves as the bourgeoisie to finance a violent revolution against the aristocracy. But no one, that's, a, that's, a, that's as much as they could say. But no one could say, by the way, by 1869, this new thing will be called capitalism. We'll have two new positions called worker and capitalists. There'll be a surplus value extraction. I mean, no one knows at the moment of an upheaval of a paradigm what's on the other side. So, um, you know, that's where we are. You know, in, in, in that regard, 
I, I think what's really interesting about Afro pessimism is it's sort of saying that we have to go down into that uh, psychic abyss in a lot of ways. Maybe you could elaborate on that just a little bit, the, the sort of Freudian elements of uh, your analysis. Yes, well, um, I would really encourage people to, uh, to start their journey by uh, reading a comic book called uh, Plants Phenomenon for Beginners. I don't know if I have it here. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I would encourage them, especially if they, if they have not studied psychoanalysis, to first start with this, this graphic comic book, um, and then go to this on Black Men by David Marriott. And one of the things that David Marriott points out in the first chapter of On Black Men is that uh, he, he, he uses a real situation uh, as, a, as a metaphor for the problems of the unconscious for Black people. And the real situation is, is a man is being lynched. Uh, he's sitting on the ground. The lynchers um, have been mutilating his body horrifying thing. They cut off his genitals and they stick his genitals in his mouth and force him to eat it. And as he's eating his own genitals that have been cut off, they force him to say uh, how good it tastes. So what is David Marriott doing with that? He's saying that this anecdote is a metaphor for how the black unconscious is intruded upon by white desire. So that white desire, or more theoretically accurate, non-black desire, which is anti-black, organizes the unconscious of everyone, and it even organizes the desire of black people. But it's a, it's a, the desire of black people has been organized through violent intervention to the point where Marriott's uh, famous or infamous line, which is um, which the sentence goes like this about the black unconscious. They, meaning black people, they cannot love themselves as black, but are made to hate themselves as white. What do you do with an unconscious that appears to hate you. In other words, what he's saying is that the ego ideal of every psyche is in some way or another organized by the exalted image of whiteness, of, of, of humanness. The exalted image of humanness is white. So even the ego ideal of a black unconscious is organized like that. And yet that organization of the unconscious is highly destructive to black people even though our unconscious is mobilized and organized by anti-black aggression and so what does that mean then if we raise the level of abstraction into the world one of the examples i give in my second book red white and black cinema and the structure of u.s antagonisms is a, a discussion of this, the, these kinds of laws um, that cropped up in the 80s and it spread like wildfire. And the one is called Street Terrorism Enforcement and Protection Act, STEP of 1988, in which the California State Legislature imagined the bodies of Black people as being always already criminalized. That is a major, major element of social death called general dishonor, as opposed to the way they would imagine the bodies 100 years ago of Italians and Irish as being criminalized by their behavior. It's a very big difference. The, the, what's called the progressive sociologists of, of University of Chicago from 1898 through 1923 wrote all of these texts about saying, you cannot demonize Jews. You cannot demonize Italians. You cannot demonize the Irish who are in these ghettos and who are, are forming mafia type organizations because 
that behavior of criminality is not organic to their flesh. The behavior of criminality is part of their social conditions. There are no parks where they live. There's no running water. There's no heat. They're overly policed. They're, they're, they're treated by the nativists as, as non-white, as not, you know. And so they work to actually write all these papers to show if you change the socioeconomic conditions of Jews, Italians, and Irish, you would change the criminal behavior. In those very same papers, they wrote, there's something organic to blackness, which is criminal. <laughs> and so, so, I mean, these are, these are progressive people. And so, you know, you have a law in California that says, based upon the state legislature looking at Compton and Inglewood in South Central LA, it says, look, if a person commits a crime in West Hollywood, for example, another part of LA, and you come back to that person's house and you find that they have a relationship with other people in the house, well, duh, of course they're gonna have a relationship, they're mommy and daddy, right? Then those people can become supplemental perps and be prosecuted as accessories or partners in this crime. It's, it makes no sense. Also, this house or apartment becomes a crime scene. And when your house or apartment becomes a crime scene, the cops have the ability to sell all your shit on a police auction. So why, why is that important? It's important because here we have a group of people projecting a fantasy of blackness as being always already dishonored, which is the same fantasy that was projected in chattel slavery, and saying that other Blacks are always already criminal in relation. Now, an empiricist, a sociologist, or a legal scholar would say, Frank, what paranoia. You're being hyperbolic. There's only been, since 1988, there's only been one person prosecuted under step. In other words, a guy uh, committed rape somewhere in West Hollywood. They came back to Compton. They saw his mother in a photo album with him, with people that they thought were gang members, and they gave his mother 18 months in prison for the crime also under step. And I would say to these people, that's not the point. The point is that the collective unconscious of anti-blackness was, as I said before, subtended with a structural violence called three million people in uniform, hundreds of thousands of police on the street, a judicial apparatus, and a prison industrial co uh, complex so that they can make their bigoted fantasies law. That's the point. The point is it doesn't need rationale. It just needs fantasies attached to structural violence. That's the part of Afro-pessimism that people don't investigate deeply enough. Is that where I've noticed in uh, some of your interviews and also at the beginning of your book, you have a quote by uh, Cecilio M. Cooper. You say, uh, this quote is, I'm prized most as a vector through which others can accomplish themselves. I, I was listening to a town hall earlier where you said, you were asked who you were, and you said that you're many things, but most importantly, you're a vector of violence. Um, what is the role of vectors in all of this? It seems like an important term for you. Yes, I, and I'm thankful to the sister uh, that they gave this, um, this, this um, they, they were having a, a conversation with me that, that actually just got published um, I can tell your readers, well, I'll, tell, I'll, I'll just send you a link to it later. You know, it got published in some British journal. But uh, yes, what, what they meant and what, uh, what they, being Cecilio, and what I meant is that um, we have, through Afro-pessimism, redefined Blackness, not as a cultural identity, but as a locus of certain types of structural practices, apparati um, and, and modes of violence. And so what happens is that the, the black is an implement for this self-fashioning of others. And that, and, and the, the, that status as a tool, that status as a tool, just like this mouse is my implement. 
okay, is very different than the status of a worker who suffers under capitalism because the worker is not an implement of the capitalist. The worker sells his, her, or their labor power. It's a transaction between subjects. I, it's an unethical transaction because if you do not sell your labor power, unlike if the capitalist does not buy your labor power, the capitalist might have hoarded enough money to live forever. You know, but if the worker does not sell his or their labor power, the worker starves. But it is not the total consumption of the worker's being to be instrumentalized by the capitalist. No, the capitalist hijacks through this purchase the worker's time, which is called labor power, to produce surplus value, but does not have comprehensive total access and control of that body, which is very different than, uh, this is why the word vector and blackness are very important, because the black is a position through which anyone can accomplish themselves in any way. That's what it means. In, in regards to, I've, I've kind of been avoiding uh, talking more about the, the biographical aspects of the book, because I I really want people to read the book. I, I think there's a lot of interesting things going on in it, uh, especially the sort of uh, connection between the biographical and critical theory. But one thing that really stuck out to me was near the end of the book, you relate an experience in your classroom where you had a student who wanted to drop the class. And for some reason, that, that, that sort of touched me because I think it gets at the heart of how Afro-pessimism sort of creates a reaction in people. Could we talk a little bit about that? Maybe you could relate what that classroom experience was for my listeners that haven't had a chance to read it yet. Yes, I mean, it, it, uh, this, this, this young woman was um, uh, biologically, her, her mother was uh, white, her father was black, um, her, her partner was an uh, East Asian American person. And what she was saying was that that, you know, she was a, just a Cracker Jack student, you know, ready for a, a senior who was ready for a second year in grad school. But the trauma of the realization of how and where she existed in the collective unconscious was getting too much to bear. And also, I, would, I couldn't write everything because the book was 150,000 words and contractually, I could not write more than 100,000. So I had to cut out 40,000 words to get to 113 some thousand. So, but if I could say more about that, you know, that I said in the epilogue, I would say that one of the issues that a lot of black students were having in my early days of teaching this was um, every student comes from high school thinking that the worst thing you can be said, uh, can be said about you is that you're not a human. And what Afro-pessimism is trying to do is, is trying to flip the script to say that the worst thing that could be said about you is that you are a human, <laughs> you know? And I hadn't gotten that across so much because I was doing so much of a diagnosis on black suffering that I had not balanced it with a condemnation of human capacity. And, um, and so in other words, it's, it, as a Marxist, it's, it's emotionally easy, easier to condemn the status of capitalists, whether it's George Soros, who gives to good causes, or Donald Trump, who's a, a straight up fascist. You know, a good solid Marxist will say, I condemn the capacity of all people to accumulate surplus value. It's that capacity that I want to violently rip from them. I don't care who they are. But, it's, but the way the word human has come into our psyches, it's very difficult for anyone, even black people to say, I condemn the capacity for all non-black people to be human. And I wanna rip that capacity from them by what any means necessary, you know, because most black people wanna be considered as human, you know? So it's, it's, a, it's an emotionally difficult task. And, and, and it, was, it was doubled in this young woman's experience because what she was seeing was capacity 
for human existence as she was learning it. She was seeing things that she had only intuited. Capacity for human existence in her mother and in her Asian partner. And the absence of capacity for human existence in her father and in her. Precisely what Fernand runs up against in Black Skin, White Mask. And it is so traumatic for him that he keeps taking left and right terms instead of going directly into the abyss, which is why I always say to people that David Marriott is a better reader of Fanon than Fanon, you know, because what we've been able to do is say, what are these moments of freak out in Black Skin, White Mask, which are like the moment of freak out for that young woman in my office? And how can we go into those moments and stay there? As Sadir Hartman used to say to me, keep your writing in the hold of this ship. You're, you're, you're trying to, you're, you're giving hope now, you're trying to come up on deck, you're trying to get off the ship, you know, get back down into the hold of this ship, shackle yourself with all the vomit and feces of all the people next to you and dead people and, live, and critique and diagnose that, you know, it's a scary place to be. And so what she was seeing was how the structure of anti-Black violence bears no resemblance to the structure of anti-Asian violence in her boyfriend. There's no resemblance to the structure of, of, of anti-misogynistic um, um, uh, violence for non-Black women. And she was also seeing that that was the elephant in the room for her family that no one wanted to talk about. And she was suffering the hydraulics of that and wanted out. But part of it was my fault because I had not done enough work to actively critique and condemn the capacity of people who are not the objects of gratuitous violence. And so I shifted the, I shifted the, the teaching a bit. And, and that's why I opened up the chapter after the nervous break, the book after the nervous breakdown with a discussion of the anti-blackness in Palestinians, because it is, Palestinians are, are given this place in the left the way Jews were given in 1945, like pure victims of a Holocaust. And I'm saying they are victims, but they're also as anti-Black as the Israelis, you know, and that's what organizes their presence. So, yes. You know, in, in that regard, I wanted to maybe get into, I, I know that you're not necessarily talking about current events in the book, but I'm curious as to how you feel about uh, what's been happening with George Floyd, because one of the things, when I said earlier that even I found Afro-pessimism jarring, right, this, this book that you wrote, I, I thought to myself, why, ah, why did I say that? I feel like I'm, like, centering myself by saying that. Like, oh, it's, it's about my feelings. And I, I think we should be doing less of that. Um, you know, it's not always about the white person's feelings. Uh, and I feel like the protests have really brought out this problem of, it seems like it's all about, well, how do the non-black people feel? How, how does the white person feel over a statue following? Or how, how does this person feel over a riot? Or how does this person feel over police brutality? When it's, it's not really about the people affected by it. You're absolutely right. I mean, and this is, you know, a, a, a professor, um, Patrice Douglas, who is now at Duke University in gender and sexuality studies, is a major, major uh, up and coming figure in Afro pessimism. And there's a whole plethora of Afro pessimist books that are being written by uh, professors and grad students that will be out in the next, you know, 10 years. And one of the things she said when she was a student in my class was, how do we keep Afro pessimism? as a black critical theory. And it was jarring to me and I had to say, well, we can't. Because just like rap music, just like, uh, just like jazz in the 1950s became the implements of the CIA and the State Department to show the world that Khrushchev was wrong when he said we were a bastion, uh, America was a bastion of Jim Crow. No, we are going to deploy our widgets, our tools, Dizzy Gillespie, Leontine Price, 
and Saravan. We're going to deploy our tools around the world to show everything is groovy, you know? So in other words, what is happening with Afro-pessimism in France and other places is that it's becoming something that is animating white critical theorists to the point because it, because of the rigor of it as a meta theory and they don't and they can don't have to deal with black suffering as a result and this is the same thing of what you're saying about the demonstrations it, it always it always happened we got to the point where where 30 40 years after the civil rights movement the the vernacular of the civil rights could be used to mobilize the agenda of people on Fox News and the Republican Party. I mean, it's, it's, it's like the body of the slave, you know? The production of the slave can you, is, is, is immediately the slaves for a, for a nanosecond, and then it becomes everybody else's property for everyone else's concerns. Um, I don't know if there's a way around that, really. You know, I think that, that the only time that that subsides a bit is when black people start burning down a whole bunch of shit but then it can equally you know i mean because no one responds to black voices there's no such thing if you look at declassified documents uh from the fbi the cia or maryland intelligence uh, community for the state police all these people agree that there's this big threat like 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 um you know public enemy would say fear of a black planet but none of them can actually say, what is the black threat? Because it's so comprehensive that it can't be written because it is, we have lost everything. They can write about the American Indian movement, aim, aha, here is the threat. They say they want 33% of the land back because that's in the treaties. But what they really want is the entire Western hemisphere back. Even if that never happens, it's conceptually coherent. He said, okay, they want their land back. Israelis, what is the threat? Ah, they want Jerusalem. But what they really want is all of Israel. So it's conceptually coherent. But what would it take to make the black hole? There's, it's, there's no sentence. It's too big. It's too large. And so, but the energy that comes from a group of people who have nothing to salvage, not just something to lose, but nothing to salvage, that kind of energy that comes from music, that comes in speeches, that comes in writing. Everybody and their mama wants some of that energy for their political project, <laughs> but they don't want the black agenda for that political project. And so I just think that, uh, sadly, that kind of thing is is inevitable. I remember when 9-11 happened and uh, baby Bush got on TV, you know, and uh, he said, he said, uh, uh, why do they hate us? You know, he's talking about, about Al-Qaeda and that, uh, you know, and I was thinking, I said to the TV, go to Compton and bring three days worth of tape recordings, you know, because you're, you, know, you, you don't have to go to the Middle East, okay? You can, you can just interview black people here. I mean, you, you don't have enough recording equipment to actually record all the answers, but you, but you could get the answers right here, you know? But no one wants to deal with that because black suffering and black rage is like a well that you drop a stone into, but you will never, ever, ever hear it touch the water yeah it's it's interesting to me because you know i i don't even it's not and i i think you've made this point in in other conversations it's not like when i said that that sometimes i felt when i was doing uh other podcasts on uh the protests i felt like there was maybe one or two many times that i sort of centered myself and i was like this is how this makes me feel and I, I, I don't even think it's a conscious thing for people, but by doing that, we sort of make ourselves the center of it rather than the, the people who are protesting or the people who are expressing rage. Uh, do you think it's a conscious thing? Do you think it's an unconscious thing going on? No, it's unconscious. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's definitely, it's, it, I mean, the only time it's, con the only people with pure conscious integrity are in the White House and on Fox News. <laughs> you know, those are the people you can trust because they speak their minds from the unconscious and the conscious. But but the the, the well-meaning white left who we have to work with, you know, or, or people of color left, 
it's it's and I've been in a lot of these organizations. You know, it's 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 definitely not conscious because no one because no one believes themselves to be people who instrumentalize black suffering for their own identity and their own needs. No one wants to be that. They're not being that consciously. So, it, but it, but it, it, but the unconscious aspect of it is very deep, because. What happens in people of color coalitions, and this is what's happening on the streets now, is that the demand that Black people embody is so comprehensive that it scares our so-called allies. Hell, it scares us half the time, okay? But if you are over 65 or under 25, you tend to not be so scared of it that you, that you don't get out of the streets and deal with it. You know, I mean, Black people who are retired are the most bitter, and clear people in the world, just like black youth who have not gone to college, right? <laughs> so, but those are precisely the people who get no airtime. Uh, you know, I, you don't you don't find Amy Goodman on Democracy Now saying, "I've got to find some people who 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 um, burnt down the police station, celebrate them on my pod, my 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 radio show, talk to them about rape." You know, it's 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 like what most people want to hear from and black people understand this intuitively so what we do is we as bourgeois politicos we manage the anger of the youth and ignore the old people and we translate all that stuff into the kinds of sound bites and discourse that the general progressive media can understand and breathe easily about you know and what does that do for us well every 20 years ago boom it, it, it erupts again because we've never actually gone um, to the source and our critical theory and our, polit our political theory has never celebrated that. What Afro-pessimism celebrates the phrase mad at the world, not the phrase mad at police brutality. Afro-pessimism is not against police brutality, it's against the police and then ratchet it up. It's against the country. It's not the actions of the country. It's it's conceptual existence and then against the world and it's so what it and, and what is interesting that we never intended for this to happen it is connecting with black youth on the ground in tumblr and some podcasts and all kinds of things from 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 vienna to you know god cape town johannesburg london canadian cities you know and it's saying to them the world is organized around your abjection not around your being discriminated but around your bodily abjection and you have a right to be joyful about any aspect that destroys this world so what they're what for the first time in a very long time maybe the first time in history critical theory from bourgeois intellectuals is connecting with people on the ground who just want to burn it all down. It's, it's like the Haitian Revolution has found its theoretical apparatus without apology. You know, but before we wrap up, an another thing I wanted to ask about, uh, you mentioned uh, the, the black bourgeoisie, and I was interested in getting your take on, you know, I, I think a lot of times, you know, I, I, I live in the suburbs, so I always have to hear people claiming that, oh, black culture is represented by uh, BET, which to me, I'm like, what? It's, it's owned by Viacom. It's owned by a bunch of white people. Uh, or I, I have to hear about uh, Tyler Perry is like the uh, black icon that everyone in the, the black community loves. And, and I'm like, there, there's always criticisms within the black community of, of these figures. I, I think there's something very disturbing to me about the, the monolith we represent about blackness culturally if does that make sense oh yeah it uh c c completely um and you know the the um the mode of production um and networks of distribution will only allow what can be housed conceptually by the non-black world to get through but there's a lot happening in the black formations that doesn't get through 
uh, to the rest of the world. And so you're absolutely right. Yeah, and I, I guess, is that sort of the potential of Afro-pessimism in a way, or do you see Afro-pessimism as, as something that could be hijacked as well? Yeah, I would, I, my dream is what you just said, that, that that is the potential. As I said before, talking about Patrice Douglas when she was a student, I have to be sober enough to realize that this theory has animated black people on the ground in one way, and it's animated uh, progressive lit crit uh, white theorists and non-black theorists in another way. And I'm not sure who's gonna win. Normally the black people don't win on that. You know, in other words, like, when, when, like for example, no one can talk about jazz in the uh, lexicon of musicology. It's almost impossible for musicologists to write about jazz as a black music. They, they, they trip over their tongue and say, well, you know, it has influences from here and it's, a, it's really an American music, this, that, and the other, you know. And I'm not an Afrocentrist. I'm not saying, oh, people, wait a minute. This is black culture. Give it back to us. I'm just noting that critically as a stumbling block of the psyche that cannot give sovereignty in any way, sovereignty of cultural production, sovereignty in terms of your bodily integrity to have consent against violation. The psyche cannot give sovereignty to blackness. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm hoping it's a race against time, JG, what you're saying. I hope that we race fast enough so that black people on the ground connect faster with Afro-pessimism than the non-black theorists who are getting excited by the rigors of it and take it for their own needs um, so that it can really become uh, a form of theoretical accompaniment to a major, major subversive insurgent and destabilizing movement. I don't know how it's gonna play out. In the past, that hasn't played out well for jazz. It hasn't played out well for the civil rights discourse, which can now be used by the right wing. It has not played out well for hip hop. Uh, so I don't know. We'll have to see. I, I guess uh, a final note, I, and I, I don't know how, how I can end on this note. I always try to end every episode by saying, uh, oh, I want to end on a positive note, but I, I think that would be contrary to Afro-pessimism. Although, I don't know, I, I like that you mentioned that idea of uh, the end of the world, because I, I think the end of the world, people have a very specific meaning when they hear that, that word uh, or that phrase. But I think the end of the world means many different things, and some of them can be more hopeful than others. It really depends on your vantage point, you know. Um, I would say to depend on, to, to know where you are, uh, go to the internet, um, look at a video or a um, still image of the police station burning down on Lake Street and then ask yourself an honest question. Does this make me really happy or does this give me pause? If it makes me really happy, then you're a good candidate for Afro-pessimism. <laughs> if it gives you pause, <laughs> then you're not. <laughs> You know, uh, I, I just thought too, and then I want to give you a chance to uh, let my listeners know how they can uh, get the book. But I, I also noticed at the beginning of the book, you have a, a dedication for uh, Asada Shakur. I may have listeners that are unfamiliar. Uh, could you explain why you did the dedication for Shakur? Yes, I, I uh, you know, my, my critical theory book that I, that I might have written after the novel was a book on the Black Liberation Army, uh, which was the insurgent group of about 400 guerrillas in the United States from 1969 to about 1981. And many of them spun off from the Panthers when the Panthers were above ground and were quashed. And so it was a group of people who fought the police um, uh, you know, in hand-to-hand -hand combat um, in, this, in this period. And Asada Shakur was a major leader and a soldier, and, and, and she's an iconic figure 
for Black revolutionary consciousness. I believe that now she's about 73-ish. Uh, Fidel Castro has given her exile. I think she still has fragments of three bullets in her chest from a shootout on the Jersey Turnpike. Uh, and I just celebrate her because she went through the fire, was uh, multiply convicted, spent uh, about a year in a men's maximum security prison in the basement, and then was busted out of prison uh, in, in New York by the, um, or was it New Jersey, I can't remember, by the Black Liberation Army. So it's, the dedication is to her and to Winnie Mandela, because when I was in South Africa, uh, Winnie Mandela was one of the people who stood up to Nelson Mandela, to uh, who wanted peace and reconciliation, and constantly pushed, tried to push the revolution forward, and was marginalized and purged. And so, these are two uh, black women warriors who uh, mean everything to me, and they are counter. They counter our celebration of peaceful. I hate this word, peaceful demonstration. I really just hate that phrase. Um, it's a crippling phrase. Uh, we should be tactically flexible so that any tactic that the black community approves of is good. And so that, that I, I wanna do what I can to keep their names in the public consciousness and uh, front and center. I, I agree 110% with that. I, I always find it, uh, you know, kind of annoying that we uh, forget figures like Shakur. Um, I don't hear anyone talk about Move anymore or Mumia Abu Jamal. And uh, I, I think we should remember people a lot more. Definitely. If you could, how can my listeners get a hold of Afro pessimism and also your previous books? They're really good. Well, thank you. Um, so, I, my first memoir uh, came out in 2008 and then was reissued in 2015 by Duke University Press. So, so that's Incognito, a memoir of exile and apartheid, and it's about my life in the States. It chapter goes from, from South Africa to the States back and forth. And that can be bought, um, you could go to the Duke University Press website. Um, if you're in a university town and you ever get back to in-person contact, uh, university bookstores would have it. Um, also on Amazon. And then the second book, Red, White, and Black, is an intellectual or academic monograph. That's also through Duke. Um, this book, uh, Afro Pessimism, that we've been talking about, comes out through Liberate, which is an imprint of W.W. Norton. And um, Norton's a great trade press, independent, uh, not, not only, it's, it's employee owned as opposed to owned by large corporations, they publish Lacan and all kinds of other people, as well as great fiction. And you can go to the Norton um, website, you could go to an independent book platform. Uh, some of my favorite bookstores are some of them online, like San Francisco City Lights Books or Moe's Books in Berkeley. And of course, there's always the default of, of Amazon. They're all there. By the way, uh, this book here, uh, Afro-Pessimism, is also available in Kindle and an audiobook. It took me 20 hours to record this audiobook. Uh, so it's my voice, and it's, but it's only 13 hours of listening, so. And uh, what would you say to anyone that has a knee-jerk reaction to Afro-pessimism? I, I know you're, you, Jared Sexton, a lot of other authors are, are starting to get into this Afro-pessimism and, and sort of talking about it more. So what would you say to the people that, have a knee jerk and, and are like almost afraid to get into it. I would say if you're black, I can understand that because it's a, you know, in, which is why I opened the book with the, uh, the moment that I had a nervous breakdown, a, a really heavy psychotic episode and why part of the book closes with that. So I, it was, it was my reading of David Marriott's on the unconscious that may have catalyzed. I, in the book, I don't really know what happened. So I, so I would say first, at level of empathy, I completely understand. It's, it's like going down into the abyss that your mind as a black person has uh, tried to avoid, like, like you talked about the student in my class at the end of the book. But I would also say that there is some type of perhaps psychic relief in developing a deeper understanding 
of how you suffer as a black person. That's one thing. Now, if you're not a black person, I would say, well, <laughs> this is going to be a ride, okay? <laughs> and and, uh, and you're going to be faced with uh, what's called an, an unflinching paradigmatic analysis of your capacity, whereas normally you've been only subjected to an analysis of your actions. And so this is going to be more difficult because it's going to be highly critical and condemnatory of your capacity to exist as human as opposed to your discriminatory actions as a kind of human. But if you are truly an intellectual and um, you want to deepen your understanding, then you can suffer that kind of emotional slight trauma. Um, and keep in mind the Gramscian phrase, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Well, thank you, Frank B. Wilderson III, for coming on Parallax Views. Thank you for having me. Look forward to it.